Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, so our speaker today is Ian Tabasco from the University of Illinois, Chicago. He's going to tell us about wrinkling patterns. And I'm glad that you could be joining us on this. Uh, well, I didn't realize it was a Thanksgiving holiday week in the U.S. So I'm grateful to everybody who's joining us. And uh, Ian, it's over to you. Thank you so much for giving the talk. Okay, thanks, Adil. And just to mention that I'm happy to take questions throughout. So if you, you know, it's a pretty informal audience. If you want to interrupt, please feel free. Um, or if you want to post to the chat box, but the caveat is I may not see it. Um, okay, so I'm gonna tell you today about uh, two different lines of research, which hopefully you'll be convinced are related to each other in the end. And uh, the general idea is to study uh, 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 the notion of an effective geometry or a homogenized geometry. So I'll, hopefully that'll become clear as time goes on what I mean. And uh, huge thanks to the organizers of GMPAC, this beautiful seminar series that has been running since maybe the beginning of the pandemic, maybe a little bit lagged. And uh, it's been really delightful. Uh, okay, so um, I put the references down uh, at the bottom of the slide, but that's mostly to make sure that I think my co-authors. So uh, I want to, for the first part of the of the of the presentation, it's going to be work done with Yusra uh, Timone, uh, Daisy Todorova, Graham Leggett, uh, Joey Paulson, one of the co-organizers of this series, and Eleni Ketafori. Um, and then the second part. Uh, is uh, uh, with Yu Zhang and Paolo Celli and Paul Pluchinski. Uh, uh, and I apologize since I've forgotten the, uh, the first name of uh, Niloy, uh, who has uh, uh, the second part will be about Kirigami. Okay, so uh, let's dive in. Um, so my screen just went blank, which sometimes happens on this old machine. So let me see if I can't fix that. There we go. So hopefully you can see that now. So the theme is a homogenization approach to shape change. And again, I'm going to present two case studies. The first one will be about wrinkled patterns in incompatibly confined shells. And the second one will be about uh, the overall motion or bulk shape change of kirigami sheets. And I'll define my terms as we go on. But the basic idea here is that as one expects anyways by now, uh, 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 when you have a system that has many sort of sub elements that can interact in interesting ways, you can expect that if you step back and look at the overall picture, so in this case, it's the macroscopic deformations of elastic bodies with uh, uh, high frequency oscillations at some small scale. You can see maybe new physics or new mathematics. Anyway, some, something that you, can, that you recognize happens in the bulk um, but is not obviously predicted by the governing equations, which live at the smaller length scales. And you'd like to homogenize. You'd like to bring the predictions of the small length scale physics up to the broader length scale and see if you can't maybe simplify the equations and understand the broad behavior. And so put another way, if you want to engineer or describe shape change, which is maybe some uh, deformable body that changes its bulk shape like we do when we locomote, uh, you might ask what is the correct macroscopic theory that avoids describing all of the internal degrees of freedom, which allows you to predict the overall shape change of a body or mass of bodies, uh, maybe in a more efficient way, right? So that's the idea. Uh, homogenization is an old term that you can think of homogenized milk, right? You, you have a jug of milk, you shake it up, and what you, what you drink doesn't really resemble its own, its own parts. So that's sort of the idea here. So let's start with wrinkle patterns. So just a brief introduction to uh, the subject of thin elastic shells. And uh, so thin shells are, so what is, what is an elastic shell? So an elastic shell, so first of all, elasticity is about objects that when, def when they deform, uh, go back to their original shape. So think of a spring, like a hooky and, uh, hooky and spring. When you, when you stretch it and you let go, it goes back to its original shape. 
Uh, and a shell is an object that prefers to be curved in its rest geometry or its rest configuration. And so, for instance, you have a beach ball on the left hand side. And I put some references. These are by now well known examples in the field. A beach ball on the left hand side that is uh, pressurized on the inside. And when you poke it, it wrinkles. So you'd like to understand what is the pattern of wrinkles that forms as a function of the poking. And we live in the elastic limit, meaning that, of course, if you poke the beach ball enough, then maybe you'll pop a hole in it. So we don't do that. So if you let go of the poker, it goes back to its original shape, right? And it's a shell because it wants to be a sphere. So the word thin comes in because there are multiple dimensions that describe uh, the shape of these things. And thin bodies are different in the way that they respond to mechanical loads than thick bodies. So if you have a block of rubber, then classic uh, three-dimensional hyperelasticity uh, explains that at leading order, a three-dimensional shape likes to deform in a way that preserves uh, uh, all of its lengths and therefore approximates a global Euclidean motion. But with a thin sheet, like a sheet of paper, uh, if I uh, apply a very small load, relatively speaking, I can accumulate a large change in shape or a large displacement. Uh, and the fact that the relative thickness is very small is what's enabling that. So here H is the dimensional thickness, sometimes it's denoted as T, uh, and L is the dimensional uh, diameter, let's say, of any one of these uh, dome-like shapes. And dividing them, you get maybe 10 to the minus 4 for these particular examples from the literature. Also, a sheet of paper has relative thickness of 10 to the minus 4. Of course, all of them are made up of different materials, but nonetheless, uh, the knowledge that they are rough, relative thickness 10 to the minus 4 gives you a, a hint as to their floppiness and to the kinds of patterns they might make. Okay, so patterns emerge from fine scale buckling, and we want to understand them. So is this a thin elastic shell? So if you if you might, you know, it, it's an online talk. I'd like to try to make it a little interactive. So what do you think? Uh, uh, maybe if you could uh, take a moment to form your opinion, maybe you can write your answer in the chat box if you want. Do you think that uh, this is a thin elastic shell? Okay, so, uh, uh, okay, great. So I got one, I got a few responses. So, uh, uh, so some people say yes. Joey Paulson says, I hope it's not thin, but I expect it is. Miranda holmes Rafan says no. Okay, so, oh, and, and here, here's an answer. Sharon Lupkin says, oh, it has reinforcing ribs. Does that still mean that it's a thin elastic shell? Um, okay, so let's see. So if you look up the numbers, uh, and here I'm talking about the cylinder of the fuselage, you see that it's about the same relative thickness of a sheet of paper. So why doesn't it flop around like a sheet of paper? Um, of course, it's a cylinder, and cylinders are maybe more rigid. And, but, and if you make a cylinder of paper, you can crush it, right? So and that doesn't take that much force. So why doesn't it crush? Of course, it's reinforced. So indeed, Sharon's right. Uh, it's more like corrugated cardboard instead of paper. So, so here you have a, a sort of a nice lesson that the geometry, you know, there's this one length scale called the relative thickness, but the geometry of the design really matters. You can understand that by adding these sorts of ribbings, you can prevent uh, maybe the most uh, typical uh, buckling motions. So if you have a thin shell, you want, to, well, you want to understand how it buckles and maybe engineer against it, uh, or maybe you want to actually allow for the buckling pattern. And so here uh, are uh, a few videos that uh, we'll, uh, we'll watch, which really got me excited about studying wrinkle patterns, where the goal is to actually observe a wrinkle pattern and understand the science of wrinkles as objects unto, unto themselves. So we don't want to prevent buckling from happening. We want to understand it and maybe understand it's linked to shape change. Okay, so uh, I kind of talked over the videos. Let me uh, uh, start this one over and explain the system. So this is a uh, uh, sort of a gondola shape or a boat shape. It's uh, PDMS. Uh, it's uh, not quite relative thickness of paper, a little bit thicker than that uh, by maybe an order of magnitude. But again, it's a polymer instead of uh, uh, paper. 
And so it floats, and uh, but because it's so thin, uh, you know, capillary forces exist, and it's acceptable for this thin object to grossly deform its shape and become approximately planar. That costs bending energy and some stretching energy in order to make the surface tension forces or capillary forces happy, right? So this is a lower energy configuration because uh, more of the water air interface is covered up by the shell. And, but of course, Gauss told us that there's no length preserving mapping from a sphere into a plane directly. And so you see some buckling away from the plane because it would cost a large amount of stretching energy to uh, try to stretch and strain all of the lengths of the surface into a planar configuration, a perfectly planar one. So it uh, departs from the plane. And now this is out of equilibrium. And if you watch the end of the video and you say, okay, so maybe the capillary forces are happy and now it's going to be a balance between, well, what's left. So uh, besides surface tension, there is uh, a gravitational potential energy. The columns of water have been displaced, uh, uh, either raised or lowered by the wrinkling pattern from their equilibrium height. And that has to compete against or balance with uh, the, the, the forces that are inside of the shell, right? So there's the, the bending force, which, which if you release the shell from the water bath would pop it back into its original shape. There's also the stretching forces uh, in the shell. And somehow all of these have to balance. And after you wait a sufficient amount of time, uh, eventually you get a wrinkling pattern. Notice there's a very slow relaxation at the very end uh, this experiment to finally an equilibrium shape. And this one has parallel line wrinkles. And maybe that's the simplest uh, motif or pattern that you could imagine. You uh, have to describe a wrinkling pattern. You draw a family of parallel lines, right? And some other more complicated uh, uh, wrinkling patterns. So one of Jose's old uh, studies that, that maybe opened up this line of research in modern times is this one where you have a thin uh, disc uh, uh, and you, uh, so again, it's thin, it likes to be a Euclidean or planar disc, and then you compress it between a convex and a concave glass lens that, and it's, you can see through it. So you're seeing through the lens, it's being uh, stamped between uh, this sort of lens shape and there's no length preserving map from the plane to the sphere, so it has to wrinkle. Uh, so back over to the ones on the right, uh, you start any of these uh, shapes out of the plane. These ones are triangles cut out of spheres. This one is a much more complicated response, but the only difference there is that uh, instead of being a, sh a sort of gondola shape, it's more like a contact lens, right? So it's much wider all around. And eventually as time goes on, uh, they find, uh, 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 let's, let's imagine that this is the lowest energy state that it could find, uh, uh, maybe global minimizer, maybe local minimizer, uh, arrangement of wrinkles. Okay, so are there any questions on the setup of the experiment? Because we're going to now analyze this for the first part of the talk. It's just one. Since you ask... mentioned... Go ahead. Yes, yeah, some questions, please. So just a... Uh, uh... In these experiments, do you know if uh, they tested like if uh, there's any plastic deformation so you can dry it back up and it would recover its shape? So uh, so Joey's online. Uh, I don't know if they tested for plastic deformations, but this one is PDMS and is known to sort of favor elasticity instead of plasticity. Uh, uh, good question, especially when you have very large deformations like the ones on the bottom. I don't know. Uh, so the next set of experiments I'll show you is polystyrene, even more elastic and less plastic. Uh, and so, uh, but I don't know if it was tested, you know, I, I don't know if these ones were recovered out of the water bath and tested for plasticity. Okay, other questions? Since you mentioned the, the length ratio, is this again about 10 to the minus fourth for this material? Or? I, I think if I recall correctly, these ones are uh, maybe an order of magnitude thicker. Uh, either 10 to the minus four or 10 to the minus three, somewhere in there. Okay, so let's, so if there aren't any other questions, let's go on. Uh, so you can, uh, okay, so, so now I'm showing you uh, Joey's version of this experiment, uh, uh, Joey Paulson. Uh, also, Eleni Ketofori's simulations, there are, 
uh, same setup. Uh, you have a, a thin elastic shell, which prefers to be some initial shape. Maybe it's a triangle on the top here. These ones have intrinsic negative curvature. So, so all of these ones prefer to be saddle shaped. If you let them go out of the water, somehow you magically removed all the water, they would spring back up into a nominally saddle shape. And these ones on the bottom would spring back up into a nominally spherical shape. Uh, and the question is, I showed you the patterns and I didn't tell you the curvature. Could you guess which ones came from the saddle, which ones came from the sphere, right? Or, uh, I mean, the other side of the question is, if I told you the initial configuration, could you predict the patterns that would form? And I see there are some questions. Let me just uh, make one point and then I'll answer the questions. So um, the patterns typically are made up of uh, two kinds of what we call wrinkled domains. Here, the word domain is supposed to uh, remind you of other pattern forming systems in, in material science, uh, uh, such as micromagnets, which form domains, uh, polycrystalline materials, which form uh, uh, crystalline uh, domains. And here we have wrinkle domains. So this uh, beautiful setup of a thin shell floating on water, wrinkles form and they arrange themselves into domains. And uh, it's driven by energy minimization. How do the domains form, right? So this is the sort of classic problem of understanding domains of some sort of uh, uh, object that forms patterns. And uh, two types of domains now. So in, in the experiments, you often see that there are parallel line wrinkles that set, them up, so, to set themselves up uh, over and over again between trials. We call those ordered wrinkle domains. Those patterns are repeatable between trials. And also, if you disturb the shell afterwards and then by poking it uh, uh, and then let it go back into a rest shape, the ordered wrinkle domains will go back to the ones that they were at before you disturb them. On the other hand, the disordered uh, part of the wrinkle domains, which you don't see any disordered wrinkle domains for the negative ones, but you do for, the pos for some of the positive ones. The generic positively curved shape has a disordered core or multiple cores, let's say. Those ones, if you poke it, then the wrinkles sort of randomly rearrange. At least we don't understand them beyond saying that they're random at this moment. And uh, also, if you do multiple trials of, say, this spherical hexagon, you'll get different uh, uh, configurations of the disordered wrinkle pattern on the inside, whereas you'll always get the same uh, uh, gross shape for where the disorder occurs. That's always going to be in this inner hexagon. And the outer flanges will, will always be uh, ordered as shown. So some questions that I got. Uh, uh, oh, Joey says he's done the recovery type experiments, no strong plastic deformation. Uh, uh, okay, good. Uh, Sarah asks, why are there concentric wrinkles on the last slide with the PDMS gondola as opposed to radial wrinkles? So I'm a little late in answering that one. So let's go back uh, to the slide here. So um, the wrinkles are a function of the initial geometry. So let, let me put the question back to you. If I showed you this picture and, and told you that it came from some shape that was non-planar, what would you guess? Uh, and uh, so this one on the top was a disc, a Euclidean disc stamped into a sphere. Uh, this one on the bottom is actually a regular cone. So this is like, think of a traffic cone. So this is a cone that's been stamped into a plane. And uh, Yoav asks, are the wrinkle patterns stable or metastable? And let me interpret this as asking whether we're looking as, at local minimizers or global minimizers, right? So that's, that's maybe not quite what you mean by stable or metastable, but um, it's, you know, if I give you any one of these patterns, it's not clear if it's a local minimizer. Uh, and a question for, for mathematical analysis would be, can you, by studying global minimizers, can you understand whether any of these are are, are global minimizers, or if you were to give it a sufficient kick, would it would it go into a lower energy state altogether, right? And it, and, and it could be that there are many local minimizers, and maybe that's why we're seeing the disordered core in the middle. What's interesting is that some aspect of the wrinkle pattern seem to be stable as if it were resembling a ground state, whereas some other aspect of the wrinkle pattern does not seem to have that kind of global stability, right? And that depends on the sign of the intrinsic curvature. Okay, so let's so any other questions before I reveal the answers for how to predict these patterns? Uh, so I just want to make sure that uh, the system is understood. Okay, so the so let's go on. So the uh, fact is that you can, uh, as we've understood, you can 
actually explain each of these patterns by simply using uh, a little bit of planar geometry. So let me try to uh, tell you why all of the patterns that you've seen on the right uh, can be understood using the diagrams on the left-hand side. So again, there's negatively curved patterns and positively curved patterns. That's the curvature that the shell remembers, right? The curvature is lurking there inside of the pattern. And if you let the shell go from the bath, it will pop back up into its initial shape. So for the negatively curved patterns, uh, all you have to do in order to predict those patterns is solve what's called the minimum exit time problem. And let me tell you the solution in two ways. Rule number one, the first way to explain it is if you draw a dot uh, uh, in the shell and you find a path that escapes to the boundary of the shell and minimizes the amount of time taken to go to the boundary at unit speed, then you'll have solved what's called the minimum exit time problem. So imagine taking variations amongst classes of paths that escape to the boundary at unit speed. Of course, you will go to the boundary in a straight line since that minimizes the distance and therefore the time taken at straight speed at, at unit speed. But there are many straight line paths that go to the boundary and the one that minimizes amongst all of them forms a right angle. And that's what the peaks and troughs of the wrinkles do. So the general law here is that uh, if you have an intrinsically negatively curved shell, which stamps into the plane, its peaks and troughs solve the minimum exit time problem. That is, they form right angles with the boundary. So all of those shells on the top, if you look at the way that the peaks and troughs set up, they always form right angles with the boundary. So if you wanted to um, encode this pattern, then uh, the concept of medial axis comes to mind, or skeleton. Uh, skeletonization or skeleton is the term from image processing. Uh, medial axis is maybe more familiar to geometers. Here's the definition. It's the collection of points which have the peculiar property that you can escape to the boundary in a non-unique way in minimum time. So take this point P and which I've drawn here now. So there's half, a, half of an ellipse shown here in this diagram on the left-hand side. And if you take this point P and you run to the boundary and form a right angle, uh, actually you could have found two points on the boundary that, would, uh, that you would escape to with equal time. And so these two uh, legs are equal legs of an isosceles triangle. And that characterizes P as belonging to the medial axis or the skeleton of the shape. So by definition, any point that escapes to the boundary by closest to time uh, uh, by two or more points live, is on the medial axis. All other points will have a unique point uh, on the boundary that you can get to in minimum time. And the medial axis pops up, pops out to your eye because it, it is where uh, uh, the amplitude of the wrinkle patterns for the negatively curved shells goes to zero. So their direction is set by the minimum exit time problem and their amplitude decays to zero at the medial axis. And I've indicated the medial axis here in white on the top. Uh, it's also known as the cut locus of the boundary. That's true. So there, there are multiple uh, uh, names for this thing. Uh, okay, good. So now let's uh, uh, consider the oppositely curved patterns for a moment. So now consider the... Um, uh, let's consider the uh, uh, positively curved patterns, right? So these ones have a disordered part and an ordered part. And I claim that you can understand them uh, through a duality transformation with, uh, uh, the with the negatively curved ones, meaning that every pattern that's on the bottom is in reciprocal or dual pairing with a pattern on the top. And here's how it goes. You take the medial axis construction uh, or minimum exit time construction, which I just described, and now you form two legs of an isosceles triangle, so simply choose to draw the base. And when you draw the base, you'll have found a wrinkle, a uh, peak or trough. I can't tell you if it's a peak or a trough or maybe something in between, but you found the direction of wrinkling for the partner or twin paired shell. So let's, let's demonstrate that. So if you take the triangle and you take these two points and you connect them up by uh, forming the base, uh, of that isosceles triangle, where these are the equal legs, you'll have uh, located uh, a wrinkle in the pear shell down here, and vice versa. Every single ordered wrinkle that shows up in the bottom can be found by applying 
this duality transformation through the medial axis construction. Okay, and so maybe it's a surprise that this one down here it doesn't have any disordered core, but you can predict that using the duality transformation because again, if you take the medial axis construction and then you connect up the uh, base by forming uh, the isosceles triangle, then all of those bases that you form, the family of bases sweep out the entire shell, therefore there is a completely predicted pattern. So where do the disordered regions come from, right? So the disordered regions come from uh, any part of the shell that isn't swept out by the base of the isosceles triangle, but that's kind of a mouthful. So there's a better way to say it. The disordered regions are in dual pairing with any point on the, on the medial axis that escapes to three or more boundary points in equal time. So uh, this one down here, if uh, you draw the point on the medial axis that escapes to four boundary points, and then you take the convex hull of those four boundary points, meaning that you form the polygon whose vertices are those four points, inside you have the disordered pattern. And that's a theorem. Any way that, dis any place that disorder arises in these shells comes up as existing in the convex hull of multiple points of escape to the boundary. Okay, so those are the two geometric rules for predicting the wrinkle patterns as a function of uh, uh, as a function of the initial curvature and the initial shape. Some questions: Can there be more than two points with equal time? Indeed, those define the medial axis, and as I've hopefully explained, uh, in any case, positive or negative understanding the medial axis unfolds the entire pattern. Okay, good. So that's a sort of geometric uh, way of parsing the data. Wouldn't it be nice if you could predict this, right? Not just say that it's true. And uh, that's what we do. Uh, so- uh, can, I, can, I, can I ask a quick question or make a quick yes, comment? Yes, Yeah, so, so later we'll talk maybe more about it, but the, the fact that the the uh, corrugations turn 90 degrees is related, I think, to the idea of the Jacobi equation, where you switch the sign of the curvature, you end up with, you know, there's a second order OD, ODE or which, whatever. Uh, which, which shell do you have in mind? Well, just any of the examples on on the on the on the left column where you're hmm. you're basically the corrugations, as you point out, they kind of switch by they turn 90 degrees. Your duality. And that mm -hmm. sort of makes sense at, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a level in terms of the Jacobi equation. You're switching from an equation like u prime prime plus u equals zero to u prime prime minus u equals zero. And it, mm -hmm. it's, like, it's like you're, you're putting an I somewhere in there, which is- Yeah, so, so I haven't understood it in terms of the Jacobi equation, but let me just answer you by saying the following and then we'll have a longer discussion, right? Right. So if you write down the amplitude, so if you write down the equivalent of the amplitude equation, thinking of uh, asymptotic expansion for these patterns, uh, uh, which I describe in, in my longer math paper, mm -hmm. uh, that equation uh, you can see as a coarse graining of Gauss's theorem. So it's not like the curvature disappeared. The curvature is inside the pattern. So to solve for the, the amplitude of the pattern, you have to enforce Gauss's law. Mm -hmm. And the role of the wrinkle peaks and troughs for that equation is that they are the lines of characteristics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this, this switching that you see between the direction, I, I don't understand it in terms of a Jacobi equation, uh, but maybe you can. I'd like to understand that if that's true. Let's, I understand it talk. as I understand it as uh, uh, sort of a switch between the characteristics that are preferred for solving mm -hmm. Gauss's theorem. Mm -hmm. Good enough. Okay, so let's. Oh. Stepping back, let's try to understand how to predict these patterns using energy minimization. Um, and so the first point is that if you don't apply tension to the boundary of the shell, then and you try to confine it, then it should actually maximize the area that it covers up in the plane, the projected area. So of course, the area of the shells it's deforming is conserved because at leading order, I've written down an energy here that has three terms. At leading order, the stretching energy dominates the analysis and somehow should be driven to zero. Epsilon is like a measure of change of length or strain. And this is a bending energy that has to do with the cost of the oscillations and tries to drive the length scale of the oscillations to be large rather than small. And this is a substrate energy that pulls the amplitude of the wrinkling pattern down into the plane. And they balanced against each other with a constraint of conserving length. Uh, and when you do an expansion of this energy around, uh, 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 around any kind of tension-free or length-shortening map, which I'll describe in a moment, you find that the leading order term 
calculates the difference in area between the initial shell and its stamped infinitesimally wrinkled uh, image in the plane. So the idea is that the wrinkle pattern is, is absorbing the loss in area due to the fact that any way of stamping the shell into the plane that decreases lengths and is therefore tensionless or tension free must uh, also decrease area. And the idea here is, and what the equation explains is that, well, to minimize elastic energy and substrate energy, you should maximize the area uh, covered up in the plane. Uh, equivalently, you should minimize the area lost by the pattern. Okay, so that takes a sort of lengthy explanation, which I won't go into today, but I'm going to just explain how it implies the patterns. Uh, uh, so again, I claim it determines the effectively planar shape, uh, one that's decorated with wrinkles and with it the wrinkle pattern. The effectively planar shape is the one you get where you homogenize away the wrinkles, so that means you take the length scale of the wrinkles to zero, and now you have some kind of uh, length shortened image, uh, all of the excess length is hidden in the wrinkle pattern. And if you homogenize this by just drawing a straight line, you'll have shortened its length. And uh, phi effective is a, a sort of a tensorial way, a map based way of saying that the initial shells should map into the plane by a length shortening map and then the excess length goes into wrinkles. Okay, so this geometric variational principle claims to determine the effective or homogenized map. And uh, the next point is that, uh, well, uh, it's not like it has admissible states that, uh, that are anything. Uh, in order to live in the infinitesimally wrinkled limit, uh, uh, and uh, based on the parameter regime of these experiments, uh, it makes sense in the infinitesimally wrinkled limit, now you're only talking about in-plane uh, objects, to study ones that are tension-free. And here I've written it using a shallow shell expansion. So in the shallow shell model of the elasticity, if I think about these shells as being almost planar to begin with, they have an out of plane displacement W, they have an in plane displacement called U, I coarse grain the in plane displacement to U effective by removing its oscillations, then E of U effective would be the linear strain measure of U, since I'm doing shallow shell theory. Uh, so that's the symmetric gradient of U. And if I subtract off the misfit from the initial shell, those are the excess lengths, I should get something which has eigenvalues which are non-positive. Uh, if I had an eigenvalue which were strictly positive, then I've stretched a length in the plane and no amount of wrinkling is going to reduce the amount of uh, strain. But if I've compressed a length in the plane, which is what this tensorial constraint does, then I can wrinkle away that excess length, right? Okay, good. So now let's, um, so I apologize for this, my computer's a little old. Uh, uh, so, let's, so let's go on. So key point number two is, well, if you believe that the effectively in-plane uh, state is supposed to be length shortened, uh, then uh, you should try to invent a notion of stress to go along with it. And that evokes, uh, that raises the question of, what is the reasonable stress strain relationship uh, for the homogenized shell. So the one where you've taken away all of the wrinkles. And of course, homogenization is a nonlinear process. So you can leave the realm of elasticity by doing this, right? And so what I've done is I've drawn a classical diagram that, so in, in the interest of time, I'm gonna maybe speed up a little bit, a classical stress strain diagram, which is, was introduced by William Prager called ideal locking. The idea is that if in the homogenized limit, my shell has to be length shortening, uh, then if I have buried all of my additional length into the pattern, it maybe doesn't take very much uh, uh, effort or stress to go between two length shortened patterns, relatively speaking. So I can move around all of these length shortened patterns with relatively little force, but as soon as I hit the barrier where I've uh, tried to now increase lengths be, be beyond my initial length, I'll have to apply a very large, relatively infinite, infinitely speaking amount of tensile force to do that. And that's what ideal locking is. So you can think of chain mail or you can think of a link of chains, right? If I have the chains which are sort of slack, then I can move around the system without paying much force. But if I lock up the chains so that they've now been sort of locked into their largest length configuration, then I, I, in order to extend any more, I have to apply a large amount of force. Okay, so that's the ideal locking stress strain diagram. Uh, 
And these things aren't fictitious, they exist in nature. For instance, if you take the strip of rabbit mesentery, mesentery is a flap of skin inside of your body that connects your uh, 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 sort of intestines to your abdominal wall. Well, anyways, so rabbit mesentery has some sort of interesting microstructure inside of it. And indeed, if you take a, a, a specimen which has an initial length, you can stretch it up to twice its initial length without measuring much tension applied. And then in order to go beyond that, you have to increase the amount of tension dramatically. And so the model for this in, in sort of constitutive modeling is called locking material. An ideal locking would be where you, uh, uh, in, where you pretend that the asymptote is the law, right? So you drop a, a perpendicular to the horizontal and you call that your stress strain law. Okay, so what good does this do for predicting wrinkling patterns? Well, the point is that once you've homogenized away all of the uh, excess length, now you have a strain tensor which has a constraint on it. So it behaves like an ideal locking material in the wrinkly limit. And so therefore its notion of stress should be a Lagrange multiplier. It should be uh, a dual object that has uh, positive eigenvalues instead of negative ones and whose product, so this is the uh, tensor contraction, the Frobenius inner product between the stress and the strain here is equal to zero. And indeed, if, if you think about uh, what stress is doing, the notion of stress for a ideal locking material where you have zero stress for moving around the strain free state and you have infinite stress for exceeding the barrier, it's a Lagrange multiplier. Okay, so it's still divergence free, it still has boundary conditions. And eventually if you parse the theory and, and ask for, well, you know, I, I'm trying to maximize the area that I've covered up in the plane. Now I write down the Lagrange multipliers formulation of that. It's possible to solve to to take the maximum area principle and write down a dual variational principle that lives at the level of the area potential alone. So this is this is not surprising to practitioners of elasticity theory that stress and strain are dual objects and that you can express the equations of equilibrium in terms of stress alone or strain alone. And what I've done is that for the ideal locking material model of highly wrinkled shells. And so this variational principle, which says to maximize amongst all choices of airy potentials satisfying constraints, the integral of the airy potential against the Gauss curvature um, is actually solving the uh, same problem as the maximum area coverage problem, just at the level of the stresses or the airy potentials. And uh, Okay, so that's uh, uh, maybe a little too much detail. Stepping back a little bit, what I've said is that stress is a Lagrange multiplier that's supposed to be a symmetric two by two divergence free tensor and ha cannot have negative eigenvalues. If you think about the area potential for that, I've written down now the formula for recovering the stress from the area potential. It means that phi is a convex function. Convex functions by definition have Hessian matrices which are non-negative definite. And that's precisely what I'm trying to ex explain. And uh, put another way, if you take uh, any of the area potentials that crop up in this problem and you connect two points in the graph by a line segment, uh, then that line segment has to lie above the graph. That's the definition of a convex graph. And now I claim that amongst all convex graphs, uh, you should maximize the integral of the graph against the Gaussian curvature subject to the constraint that the convex function is equal to a paraboloid one half x1 squared plus x2 squared at the boundary and exterior of the shell. Okay, so the admissible area potentials are non-classical because they can have kinks, they're non-smooth. They're convex functions that extend one half x1 squared plus x2 squared into the cutout shape and then you select the one that maximizes the integral against the Gaussian curvature. That's the dual stress theory for predicting the uh, wrinkle patterns. And when you do that, uh, lo and behold, you get uh, ruled surfaces actually. So that was that's maybe surprising from the outset, but the optimal convex functions have lines of ruling, which I've drawn. So those are line segments in the graph. And when you project those lines of ruling down to the plane, you recover the wrinkle patterns. So the long story short uh, is uh, that the wrinkle patterns that you observe uh, are nothing other than the projection to the plane of lines of ruling of an optimally chosen convex graph. Okay, so that's, the, that's sort of the encoding that's going on here. I think of it in the limit as being plane elasticity. I introduce an area potential, 
I decide to make the area potential a convex function for these reasons, I select it through a variational principle, and then its lines of rulings project to the plane as the wrinkles. And now the fact that there's a dual relationship between positively and negatively curved wrinkles can be understood at the level of the area potentials. It turns out, and this is by no means obvious, that the optimal convex area potential for a positively curved shell and the optimal convex area potential for a negatively curved shell are Legendre transforms of each other. And therefore, the wrinkle patterns are duly related between positively and negatively curved shells. So you can understand many other predictions. For instance, the layout of the, cur of the pattern depends only on the sign of the Gaussian curvature, not on its value. Uh, uh, and these shells have variable Gaussian curvature and still show the same wrinkled patterns. The amplitude absorbs the variable Gaussian curvature. Okay, so um, I'm gonna move on to the next topic. I'm happy to entertain questions at length after the talk. I've already had some questions, so Adil, I think I'm gonna shoot a little bit over. Uh, good, next topic. So let's reset. Uh, we've been talking about how to predict uh, we've been talking about the connection between shape change and pattern formation uh, in elastic systems and Kirigami metamaterials or mechanical metamaterials is a nice uh, example of that uh, that has become quite popular these days. Uh, and here I showed you a bunch of examples of, of what we now think of as mechanical metamaterials in the literature. So what are mechanical metamaterials? So uh, broadly speaking, a mechanical metamaterial is a many body system with elastic interactions. Uh, so think of a, a lattice of springs. Uh, you can have uh, none of the things that I'm showing you are lattices of springs, but think of a lattice of springs and then the springs are the elastic interactions and the bodies are the nodes. Um, or what you can do is you can take a sheet of, you can take a, a origami that has many folds and you can idealize this uh, through a ball spring model as having uh, sort of plates that want to interact across uh, ridges and so on and so forth. And then you have a many body system with elastic interactions. Kirigami is uh, where you cut holes into the sheet. So uh, the idea of removing material from a body and then studying its effective properties is quite familiar from uh, uh, high contrast homogenization uh, uh, in maybe electromagnetism. Uh, in mechanical, in the set, in sort of the setting of mechanics, here's the analog of that. You punch a bunch of holes out of a thin sheet and then you allow the material to deform. And now what is the space of shape changes that are allowed or deformations that's allowed, right? So at some local scale, you should have Euclidean motions, but then at a global scale, you can accumulate a non-Euclidean motion. That's the point. And Sharon asks, is it Mira Ori on the right? Indeed, this is the famous Mira Ori pattern on the right. And the amazing fact is that whereas Mira Ori has a negative Poisson's ratio in the plane, out of the plane, it deforms to approximate a saddle. And one would like to understand from a sort of first principles approach, if I give you any one of these uh, many body systems with elastic interaction, how do you coarse grain the interactions to predict, for instance, a negative Poisson's ratio effectively or some other characteristic of the deformation? So I've been studying this in some detail for planar kirigami with, uh, uh, so these are not my experiments. They're experiments of Paolo Celli at Stony Brook uh, and Paul Pluchinski, who's at USC. And the three of us have uh, developed a way of coarse graining uh, to write down a partial differential equation governing the effective or bulk motion of these systems. So what is what are these planar kirigami systems? So you take, a, again, it's a thin sheet, now it lies in the plane. It's perfectly happy to lie in the plane. And you make slits or cuts and you cut a lattice of holes. That's the rule. So you can imagine on the bottom that you cut out a uh, uh, sort of alternating choice of slits and rhombuses. Maybe you can idealize the slits themselves as being rhombuses, which are almost degenerate. And then on the top, you have slits that are alternating as well. And you have a lattice of these things. And where, uh, you know, what happens to the holes? That's kind of the question. If you load, uh, I really apologize for this. My, uh, uh, my slides are seeming to sort of give me trouble. If you, okay, so I wanted to sort of jump back and forth between these two. So if you, if you load the thing with a two-point tension test, uh, 
you can see that, uh, uh, well, the holes open up. <laughs> and somehow the geometry of the problem is sort of hidden and the mechanics of the problem is hidden in understanding how the holes open up, right? And uh, so, okay. Uh, so local mechanism, so a mechanism motion uh, by definition in the, in the engineering literature is one that is sort of a, a, a multiple Euclidean motions that interact to form a mechanism. Uh, you can think of, so mechanism is a very old term. You can think of uh, uh, any kind of uh, a system that has multiple parts and you enforce a, rigid, a rigidity constraint or a rigid length constraint. It admits a mechanism motion if the system is uh, movable in a way that is uh, non-global non Euclidean motion, right? So if I, if I take a system with many particles and I enforce length constraints and I rotate it globally, that's not a mechanism. It's the internal motions that are mechanisms. And so here you see that the individual building blocks are these uh, uh, two by two cells of panels and the panels have various shapes and they admit mechanism motions as subsystems unto themselves if you idealize them by having a pin joints, let's say, where the individual panels can rotate perfectly at the corners, uh, then indeed due to the presence of the hole, which you can, you can just think of the hole as um, a four bar linkage. Uh, you will see that there is a mechanism motion that opens up the hole, right? So the, the map that goes, simply put, the map that goes from these four squares to those four squares is length preserving on the squares. And so if you zoom into any of the individual uh, two by two cells in these samples, you'll see something that is approximately mechanistic. But the best approximating mechanism varies at the scale of the panels. So that's the question. How do local mechanisms vary to uh, accumulate up to an aggregate non-Euclidean motion? So here's a way to coarse grain and uh, predict uh, those non-Euclidean motions. So what you do is you take, uh, uh, you, okay, so you imagine that, um, you know, be, there's a lattice, there's a lattice behind these things. So imagine that you uh, draw the uh, initial configuration of the Kirigami uh, in the following way. You introduce Bravais lattice vectors, S and T, and if you tessellate the two by two cell pattern along the Bravais lattice, you, Bravais lattice vectors, you build up the initial reference configuration. So the question is, what happens to the Bravais lattice vectors under a pure mechanism deformation? And then we'll say that that's the local picture, right? So if I take the uh, pin jointed system where I enforce uh, length constraints exactly and I allow for rigid uh, uh, rotations around corners, uh, it's not difficult to write down a formula for the deformation of the Bravais lattice vectors S and T going to S def and T def as a function of the individual uh, degrees of freedom of the mechanism. And just to give those things names, let's notice that each uh, two by two cell can execute a global Euclidean motion. That's not a mechanism, but that's called gamma, the rotation angle of that. And then the parallelogram on the inside can change its angle and let's call Xi the uh, change in it. So this diagram has a mistake. Let's call Xi the change in angle of the, uh, uh, of the internal uh, hole, right? So it's a, it's a parallelogram. So I can parameterize its length preserving motions as a four bar assembly by simply parameterizing the change in angle. So gamma and Xi, and as a function of gamma and Xi, you get a, a alternating array of counter rotations uh, in any one of these systems. And so then that allows you to write down a, a coarse grained uh, homo or homogenized uh, uh, effective deformation, which for a pure mechanism motion would just be a linear mapping or an affine mapping. Uh, okay, so I'm, I'm trying to build up hyperelasticity by explaining which affine maps are energetically preferred, right? And uh, so from the microstructure, you get these kinds of maps. And it just tells you that there's a way to link the internal uh, C mechanism actuation and the gamma rotation to uh, an affine map. And now you make a leap of faith, which is to say that you assume that at the macroscopic scale, you simply have a coarse grained version of the previous mechanistic picture. So if I zoom into any of the individual cells, I see a mechanism motion, but if I take the bulk object, I should see that the mechanism can vary, right? And this is a this is more than a leap of faith because uh, if you look at the supplementary information we have introduced a ball spring model and shown uh, 
that uh, this uh, coarse-grained partial differential equation, which picks up the allowable deformation gradients in the homogenized limit, allow you to drive the internal energy of the panels down to sub uh, area scaling. Okay, so area scale, so this it's a two-dimensional two system. And if I introduce a ball spring model on it, I get energy scaling like area, I, I haven't really done you know, I haven't taken advantage of my mechanisms. But if I choose the right uh, way to tile up my mechanisms according to this PDE, uh, I can reduce the energy in a ball spring model down to sub area scaling. Uh, so these are what's known as uh, floppy modes or soft modes in the literature. So what's this PDE? It's saying that the deformation gradient, which is the linear that best linear approximation to the bulk motion, is equal to the tensor that you would write down if you assumed you had a pure mechanism at that scale. And that's the one on the right hand side. So R is the rotation of each cell parameterized by gamma and A is a shape change tensor which you read off from the formulas on the left. It has an explicit formula. A is not always symmetric. It depends on the shape of the holes. Good. So once you have this, you can try to solve it. And one thing you can do with this class of PDEs is you can characterize them as being hyperbolic or elliptic. So let's sort of introduce this terminology a little bit. So a hyperbolic PDE is one that linearizes to a wave equation. An elliptic PDE is one that linearizes to not a wave equation. So one that linearizes to uh, something that resembles uh, Laplace's equation, but you can have coefficients that are not equal to each other, right? And you can detect whether or not you have a hyperbolic or elliptic PDE by looking for uh, solutions which are linear perturbations of nonlinear uh, states. So you take any of the nonlinear solutions to the PDE I wrote down on the previous slide, and then you add a linear perturbation, which has uh, maybe a wave vector uh, uh, and uh, a lambda, and you ask whether it's complex or real, right? And that'll, it's an imaginary or real. And that'll tell you whether you're looking at a hyperbolic or an elliptic PDE. There's also a purely tensorial way to do that using discriminants. Long story short, the type of the PDE, which tells you whether you should have wave-like behavior or not, uh, spatially wave-like, uh, is a function of the geometry of the holes. And so in particular, if you write down the PDE I got on the previous slide and you compute its effective Poisson's ratio, then it will be negative if and only if the PDE is elliptic. And the effective Poisson's ratio will be positive if and only if the PDE is hyperbolic. And you can actually see that in the pictures because notice the ones, the, the, so these are experiments on the left and uh, not really a simulation. This is more like a solution we found of the PDE that we used to plot the motion of the panels. Uh, you can see that there is a sort of wave-like character to this because uh, you see that there are characteristic lines along which C is roughly constant popping out to your eye, right? And we know that wave type equations, even if they're nonlinear, should have characteristic lines. And those are these. Uh, whereas if you take the uh, elliptic samples, like the rotating squares one here, you don't see characteristic lines. Instead, you see that the level sets of C sweep out arcs, as they would if you had a heat equation or a, or a Laplace type equation. Right? And at the end of the day, the sign of the Poisson's ratio, so whether or not the sample likes to sag in the middle when you pull it on its ends or likes to expand in the middle when you pull it on its ends, dictates the type of the PDE. Good. And uh, OK, so I'm almost out of time. I had some questions, so I'll allow myself to go a little bit over. Um, so uh, let me just say a few more things. Uh, and uh, OK, so let me go on to the next slide. Uh, OK, so, so OK, I never answered this question so far, right? So I, I told you there's a PDE. I told you that the PDE coarse grains the geometry of the panel motions. But what sets the response? Like, where has the mechanics gone, right? So if you zoom into these things, it's a multiple scaled system. It's got two scales, I mean, three scales, but two relative scales. There's one which is the number of panels per uh, uh, device size. That's little l. And then there's uh, delta, which is the hinge size. And in some sense, you'd like to understand, uh, you know, where do the forces go? So if you apply the forces to the body, uh, do they, does the stress accumulate in the hinges? Does it exist in the panels? Does it do both? 
And by understanding that, you would be able to write down uh, uh, force balance in the aggregate for these systems, and therefore select a solution of the PDE from the uh, grab bag of solutions that exist, right? You can do that. And the idea here is that uh, uh, so this is a recently submitted paper of ours, and, and we're, we're writing up other versions of it because I think this is a, a story you can attack uh, either purely mathematically or, or then from maybe the constitutive modeling point of view. So this paper that's on the archive is more about constitutive modeling. Here's a constitutive model for, the, uh, for calculating the aggregate force balance. And the idea is that uh, in sort of the homogenized sense, the energy could, could be modeled as having three types of terms. The first term enforces the PDE. W0 is a typical hyperelastic energy functional, which could be associated to standard elasticity. But instead, but instead of favoring pure rotations, I want it to favor solutions of the PDE. And so I've added this inverse shape tensor here, right? So if W0 is a hyperelastic energy density that vanishes on a rotation, then by writing this expression down, uh, you'll get something that vanishes when the PDE is solved. Grad Y is a rotation multiplied by A. So that's how we're going to enforce the PDE. You can interpret C0 as a Lagrange multiplier then. And then the rest of the terms have to do with uh, the mechanics of the hinges uh, and the cost of changing the best approximating mechanism from cell to cell. And uh, for instance, imagine that you have this uh, hinge that has to undergo a rotation. I mean, it's rotate sort of, its neighbors are rotating, right? So that has a sort of torsional spring aspect to it. And so you could imagine in a sort of first pass of modeling, you know, I don't promise this is exactly correct, but in a first pass of modeling, you could imagine that the cost of rotating a hinge is proportional to the angle through which you've rotated. And that's what this uh, squared. And so that's what this is saying. Okay, and then this term has to do with uh, the cost of varying the mechanism from cell to cell. Uh, the only mechanisms that are available in the system uh, are the uh, perfect sort of pin uh, counter rotating uh, pin jointed ones that I showed a, a moment ago. So if you allow that to vary from cell to cell, you have to pay an energetic cost and it's natural to expect that that goes like the square, the gradient of the mechanism, uh, variable parameterizing the mechanism. Now. In the submitted paper, uh, we don't really give an argument for why you should, ex uh, you know, wh why you can coarse grain the mechanics to get this energy. We propose this model and then do finite element simulations. Uh, we're currently writing up other papers where we actually do a coarse uh, sort of uh, coarse graining procedure from the mechanics at the micro scale and derive uh, this expression from first principles. But that's not the subject of this talk. So let's take this energy. So to end, let me take this energy and do a finite element simulation. That was uh, Paul's postdoc, Yu Zheng, did these. Let's see what we get, right? So this is a standard abacus model. Uh, all she's done is take an abacus and used this energy functional and done some fitting. So there are three parameters, C0, C1, C2. Actually, there's only two parameters because you can scale C0 out. And so the ratio C1 over C0 and C2 over C0 are fit. And then forces are applied, or actually, dis in this case, displacement boundary conditions are applied. And on the top are the experimental samples in Paolo Celli's lab, and on the bottom are the predictions of the abacus simulation using this model. Um, and uh, again, you can see the hyperbolic character versus elliptic character sort of jumping out. Uh, if you want fine, finer grain predictions of the uh, level sets of the angle function C, that's where this model sort of comes in, right? Good. Um, so I think that's maybe a good place to wrap up. Uh, thanks for being patient with me with the sort of difficulty I had with the presentation, but uh, hopefully uh, you got something out of it. I just wanna say that uh, to wrap up, uh, this has been a talk about connecting macroscopic shape change to microscopic pattern formation. And uh, at many levels, mathematical and mechanical, et cetera, we very much understand now that shape change and pattern formation come hand in hand. And uh, it's a fun uh, game to try to link these two up. Okay, so thanks for listening. I'll take questions now. <laughs>